Hey guys, welcome to the Bile Hour. Oh, Dr. Corey wants a selfie. Okay, thanks Dr. Corey. Good. Well, we know who our guest is today, right? Hey, we got lots of different kinds of chapels. Uh, we got speaker-driven chapels, we got guided prayer chapels. <laughs> this one is meant to be discussion-oriented and interactive. Mm -hmm. So in this chapel, your phone is your friend. So if you wanna take out your phone and ask us questions, we're gonna answer the questions in the second part of this chapel. So on the screen is gonna be um, where you can find us, okay? You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter. Please use the hashtag, the Biola Hour, but you can also email us at thebiolahour at biola.edu. So the first part, we'll discuss something that is something that we think is important for our Biola community. There'll be a reflection piece in the middle, and then we will answer some of you guys' questions in the second part of the chapel. Dr. Corey became the eighth president of Biola in 2007 with the constantly changing landscape of higher education, the church, and legislation. He's guided us masterfully in the last nine years and set us up for a promising future. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here. Let's, let's welcome Dr. Corey today. Good morning. morning. All right, Dr. Corey. Hey, you know, I've heard you say that we um, need to learn how to be Christians in a post-Christian world. I know some are reluctant to concede what is post-Christian world? What does that mean? And I, I know some people don't necessarily want to accept that we're, in, we're living in a post-Christian world. Why do we have to accept that? And what are the implications of something like that? Good morning, Viola. Friday morning, you're here. Good morning. This is great. Um, yeah, and thank you, Michael. You're like the Conan O'Brien of like, <laughs> Viola. This is awesome. People um, say I look like Andy Richter. I don't know if like, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but okay. Uh, yeah. That's it's great to see you all here this morning. I know John over there, there in the keyboard, your, 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 your dad's here from Montana. Tim, and Uncle Brian, so welcome wherever you are. Glad to see um, uh, some maturity in this room. Um, <laughs> yeah. Was that like not that funny though? But It's I, okay, that's yeah. okay. I know this is, a, maybe this is um, Friday morning, it's Biola. It's great to see you all. And this, I actually have not even come to one of these, unfortunately, yet. So I'm learning what this Friday morning uh, Biola hour is like, but I like it. Um, and thank you for um, your hospitality, uh, Michael, on. So, so um, yeah, the question about the post-Christian world, it's got an interesting question, isn't it? Because yeah. um, if you actually look at what's happening in the world today, like, it's hardly post-Christian. I mean, yeah. God is alive and well uh, globally and, and yeah, what's, what's yeah, happening yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with, with people coming to Christ and and revival and renewal and, and church growth and, and, and um, seminary starting and, right. and, and, and the distribution of the gospel in some really magnificent ways and dreams and visions and Muslim people. There's just so much going on that's, that's kind of going to be beyond our, our grasp. So um, it's hardly a post-Christian world. But I do think that uh, Europe and increasingly North America right. are are trending that way. Yeah, I mean, if you look at statistics about how many churchgoers there were ten years ago versus today, it's gone yeah. down by about ten percent. If you look at the percentage of the nuns, that's not N U N S, the religious women, but the <laughs> N O N E S, those who say they declare none in terms of religious affiliation. That right. number um, has gone up. And uh, so I think that, uh, and I think that if, even as you, I mean, there's an election on Tuesday, right? And, mm. and I think even as we listen to the, uh, the, the rhetoric of this campaign, um, it is hardly reflective of um, kind of the deeply held um, values that are embedded in us as Christians. Like even the fruit of the spirit of, of, of kindness and self-control and faithfulness and joy and, right. and, and, yeah. and love, they're just like absent. Right. Um, that's another story for another day, maybe. But um, yeah, but I do think it's true. Um, you know, one of one of the uh, by all, this this uh, this summer, there's this uh, this sweet elderly couple yeah. that gave a significant uh, gift to Bible University to start uh, the Center for the Work and Ministry of the Holy Spirit, which I, it's awesome that yet we do that because um, sometimes I think we think the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Scripture, and, and mm. we lose the presence of the Spirit. Like, what's the Spirit doing? not just at Biola, but in our world. And one of the dimensions of, of this gift is even to bring global leaders for you students to be here to say, this is what God is doing around the world uh, today. So beginning next year, we're going to see this influx of global leaders just telling stories about the amazing things and to ignite the passion again in your own hearts uh, of what, what, what God is doing and how he is at work through the, through the Spirit. Great. Um, 
let me just kind of maybe wrap it up with this, and that is, um, even when you, well, you look at the Old Testament and, and, the, and the remnant of God's people, and you look at, the, at, at captivity and, and the people of God that were brought into Babylon, hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's one thing to, to flourish in Jerusalem when you're the dominant people group there as the people of God. That's good. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one thing to survive in Babylon, saying, like, we're just going to gut it out, and we're overwhelmed, and we're the minority, and we're in a pagan culture, and it's increasingly um, uh, kind of anti-God and everything about it, and we're just going to hunker down and just... But, 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 but God's word says, like, you don't just survive in Babylon. You thrive in Babylon. This is what mm. I've called you to do. And um, that's what Daniel did. That's what the, you know, the people of, of God, they said, we're going we're gonna to keep our standards as to what God has called us to be. We're going to be people of integrity and people of the word and people of, of serious faith. But we're also, we're committed to, this, to the thriving of this society. And Jeremiah yeah. says, you seek the peace of that city. And that city's not Jerusalem. That city's Babylon. Yeah. And you plant gardens there and you build houses there and you, yeah. you know, celebrate your families there. This is, this is the world you're in. You make it a better world. And I think That's that... Right is what God has called us to be. So I think this is actually our finer moment as we mm. kind of step into the new reality before us. If indeed um, we are trending towards a, a less Christian culture, yeah. you know, hey, Christians can rise up and, yeah. and, and, and be that sweet aroma of Jesus in, in right. new and winsome ways. And that's, yeah. anyway, I'm I love that. It. I love that vision, a new paradigm shift toward going toward mm -hmm. and, and even being part of a, a, a mm -hmm. culture that is more post-Christian, mm -hmm. right? But with that in mind, you said something about the elections, right? How do we approach election season? <clears throat> excuse me, how do we vote? Or do you have any suggestions for us as we think about, like, who to vote for, what propositions we might want to vote for, things like that? Uh, no, I don't um, <laughs> have any, any recommendations there. But I, I, I do say vote. Yes. Um, and, um, but I, uh, this, this election season, I think, has, um, has underscored, I think, these growing divides yeah. in our culture, mm -hmm. which I, I think the rhetoric and tone of this election, it smells like smoke. It's re reprehensible to God. It, it, it grieves his heart. Mm -hmm. um, it is, um, you know, when, when some of the, some of the, I mean, when you look at some of the things that, that the good things that are happening and, um, there are those on different sides of the aisle that actually have formed good relationships and do have respect for the dignity of each other. And you can, yeah. you don't have to, um, affirm each other's choices to listen to each other's voices, right? Or yeah, you yeah. don't have to see, um, eye to eye to work shoulder to shoulder right. and, but something is happening now that, that, and I apologize for you students, that you're, you're witnessing my generation being so uh, caustic and so mean-spirited. You don't have to um, beat a person to beat an idea. Yeah. You can beat an idea by beating an idea. And so we can yeah. wor work in the world of ideas and, 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 and disagree with people. But when, when right. it comes to that, that lowest common denominator of just right. berating individuals and tearing them down. Yeah. I just, I'm just, that's like, that's not who we are. Yeah. And, um, and I think you are, you've got to be the corrective of that. Yeah. Because, because we're doing it wrong. And there's something that could be done yeah. better. I mean, I, I, I've talked about this, and you guys know this, in the term of like kindness, right? right? The whole idea of like, what does that mean to live this profoundly kind life? And kindness is, is, is radical. It's not a random act, it's this revolutionary life, and the way in which we do that is that we can live this life of really a firm center, this is what we believe in, and then we can have soft edges that, that yeah. engage with people yeah. and are patient, and we listen while wanting to learn rather than listening while waiting to respond, yeah. and there's a big difference there. We've, right. we've, it's, there's something wrong with yeah. our culture, and I think the antidote is, is how do we live out the, the fruit of the Spirit uh, in our lives, and, and, and when we live this life of kindness, it, sometimes you're going to be rejected for your kindness, sometimes you're going to be accepted, but your kindness is never going to be forgotten, because there's something powerful um, about that right. life of kindness, and that's, um, it's countercultural. it's risky, mm. it, it, you might get the, you know, the cold shoulder, the fist, the finger, whatever it might be when you're kind to somebody, but you got to keep on leaning into that, because that's what, that's what God wants us to do, and and that doesn't mean it's the same as niceness, where we kind of give up on our convictions and we're kind of wishy-washy at the core, but kindness just allows us to, it, it's freeing. I think the opposite of kindness is actually not meanness. I think the opposite of kindness is fear. 
Huh. I think we're, you know, we're afraid of the Supreme Court, we're afraid of the president, we're afraid of the Muslim, we're afraid of the immigrant, we're afraid of the gay person, whatever it might be, and, and get rid of all that and be in yeah. community and engage in conversations and invite people to your homes and, and build bridges and don't build walls. It's, yeah. it's got to be a new day, and it's not happening. When it gets back to your question, uh, Michael, about the, the election, it's not happening, and it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a travesty that it's not, and we've got to do something about it as the people of God. Great. So, Dr. Corey, we're going to answer some questions now. Okay, and these are questions that are been given to us by our students and our Bible community here. And here's our first question. Okay, it says uh, you talked about the importance of diversity, <laughs> but many in the LGBT community feel excluded by Biola's stance on SB 1146, which is our Senate bill, which just happened this past summer. How do you reconcile this apparent contradiction? Yeah, great. No, I think most of you know Senate Bill 1146 uh, introduced, and in, in, it's a state bill that would that had various iterations to it along the way, and, and people freaked out over it, yeah. um, thinking that uh, this is the first um, encroachment on um, the, the 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 freedoms that institutions of higher learning in the state of California, the 30 or so that are faith-based. This is a Catholic, Protestant, denominational, non-denominational that ultimately is at the beginning of the end that. Um, these institutions might be gutted yeah. uh, from their religious values so that, that religion would no longer be legal to be a part of our institutions if we have any kind of state funding. So mm. um, people freaked out over it, and there was a lot of uproar. It became a national story because in many ways, California is seen as a, as a state that other states trend after. Um, at its worst, when it was being um, amended along the way, it would have denied Cal grants, um, some of you are here on Cal grants, we have over 800 students, it would denied Cal grants from students who come to places like Biola or Westmont and other schools, it would have, um, it would have affected the way in which we can hire people based on religious beliefs, um, yeah. it would have made the school subject to lots of lawsuits along the way, so there are some real onerous uh, parts to it, but I've, I've been with the authors of these bills, I've sat in their offices with them and um, had in extensive conversations, and, and you know, what they're saying is that we want to make sure that, that places like Biola are safe places yeah. for LGBT students to be here, yeah. understanding that we have covenants of how we live together as it relates to human sexuality. Yeah. They've been part of the Christian faith and the biblical understanding of, of marriage sexuality for millennia. Um, so as it relates to that, um, we ended up being in support of the bill in its final form as a disclosure bill, meaning that we have to actually right. be really clear what our principles are. So yeah. we weren't opposing it at the end, but as we've talked through um, how it could be a better bill, it, it came to a part where we, at the end we said, yeah, that's a bill that we can, we can live with. Um, but we have, we have work to do yeah. uh, as a community. Um, we had one of the authors, uh, a, a, a legislator from California, on campus this week. Um, spent four hours in, in conversation on this community. I, I had a four-hour dinner uh, this week uh, with him. Yeah. And, and, and part of it is, like, like, there is a gross misunderstanding of what places like Biola are really like by those in maybe some special interest groups that, that say we're all this. But there's also, a, I think, a misunderstanding on our part mm. of some of the intentions of those who want to make sure that students in California schools, that they that there's no bullying um, that, that's allowed here, there's no right. harassment, that students, um, regardless, feel like they're, and we've got work to do. Right. And, um, and you know, that whole kindness thing that I was talking about a few minutes ago, kindness means listening. Again, as I said, listening, not waiting to, well, to respond, but listening while wanting to learn, and we've got some learning to do. Yeah. And even the conversations that we had the day before yesterday, all afternoon, and <laughs> till t I, did, I missed the Cubs game. I missed Game Seven of the World no, Series. Didn't. That was that was epic. I missed that. Whole, I missed it because I was in this conversation. But this, this conversation was so uh, important. This dinner that we're having up in Pasadena, right. just a, a, this basically four of us around a table, um, is that we've got you've got to build bridges with those that you stereotype from a distance. Because when you do, you realize that wow, there's a lot more room for conversation and a lot more room for self uh, intro, uh, some introspection as well. And that's what. And, and we're spending time. We've had faculty conversations about this, staff conversations. Our board is talking about this. How can we be 
a yeah. better community as it relates to being a place where no one feels marginalized, no one feels unwelcome. And at the same time, we can live within um, our, our covenant of understanding of this is what community looks like. And, and uh, I think we're making progress, but we've got a ways, we've got a ways to go. And, um, and I apologize. Like, we've made mistakes in the past, and yeah. we're going to try to do things really better. And part of doing that better is listening to those that you feel like, hey, no, they're our enemy. We're not going to listen to them. They're, they're, they're trying to attack us. But when you bring someone into conversation right. and you break bread together and, and, and have a meal with each other, you know, it, it's something, something... I actually think the Spirit of God is at work in these conversations. Yeah. Um, Romans 2, 4 says, God's kindness leads to repentance. Yeah. Um, not all the judgment stuff, not the distance, but kindness demands proximity. Mm. And so, you know, this question has a lot to do with how we're bringing people into proximity that we, may, we might have felt like, you know, we want to keep them at a distance. Great. I know I'm, I'm rambling on, but let me just say one more thing because Absolutely, I think this yeah. is like really, uh, really important. But when, when, when Romans 4 says God's kindness leads to repentance, sometimes when you go into proximity, with some, that repentance is your own repentance. Wow. It's not like if I did demonstrate God's kindness to somebody else, they're going to repent of their ways. But I think it's part of it is like, we're going we're gonna to repent of our ways. Yeah. And, there, and there are things that we need to repent of. And I, and I think that leadership in this generation today has to be much more transparent, and much more vulnerable, and say, this is, our, this is some stuff, and we've got to do some things differently. And yeah. we do, and we will. Great. Period. All right. Period. Done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Okay. We, Let's go to another question. Oh, we're not done yet. Is that okay? No, 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 We've no. got a few more questions okay, that yeah, I think good. our students want to ask. Okay. So this is from Samantha Kay, and she asks, you said fear is the opposite of kindness. How does that relate to people's more typical understanding of it being cruelty? Of um, typical understanding of, of... Like the opposite of, of kindness yeah, yeah. being fear. Usually people think the opposite of kindness, kindness is, cruelty. is cruelty. Like how does yeah, that... Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's what I think. I... I, you know, I actually really believe that um, the reason why we're not kind is because we're, we've got some real insecurities, mm. some real fears. Right. Like, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm afraid of, if I'm kind to someone, it's easy for me to be kind to the barista, right, when she gets my latte right. That's easy. Yeah. It's easy to be kind when there's harmony in my family. Yeah. But when there's tension, it's hard to be kind because what if I'm, what if I'm rejected? Um, what if, you know, what if um, someone says something, like, unkind to me when I'm trying to be kind? Yeah. And the, and the, the, the instinctive thing is say, okay, I tried it, I'm done, I'm going to, and so you just kind of walk away. And that's the, that's the difficulty, I think, of, of, of living this life of, of like, 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 profound generosity uh, of spirit. It's actually liberating yeah. to live that way because kindness is not... Um, about being thanked. Kindness is about being obedient. And you mm. may be thanked, you may not be thanked, but when you live obediently, then it doesn't matter if people accept you or not. You just, and so then you can kind of let down your guard and say, you know what, I'm going to be kind to that person who you know, I've got tension with in, yeah. in, in my roommate situation. And if it creates more tension, you know, well, it's just the way it is. But I, this is what, um, kindness is a seed, and sometimes seeds germinate right away, and, you, and, and, it, and it breaks down walls of, of racial irreconciliation, and, you, and, and kindness says, you know, we've, we're in community with each other. But sometimes that seed takes a while to germinate. Yeah. Sometimes you might see it within weeks or months, and sometimes you might see it in eternity, like what your act of kindness has done, or your life of kindness. And so, you know, it's not, I don't think it's cruelty is the opposite of kindness, though that I think there's a truth to that. But I do think the opposite of kindness is fear. We're afraid of what might happen if we're kind yeah. and someone's not kind back. Or we're afraid of what happens if we're kind and people say, why, why are you kind to that uh, you know, Islamic storekeeper? Don't you know what they're trying to do? And right. da, da, da. And that's right. just like, it's not the way we need to live. Right. Free yourself up from that. Kindness right. is liberating. Right. It's anyway. like cruelty is there, but fear is underlying that cruelty. Fear is underlining even. it, yes. So, great. Here's another question for us. As Christians fracture to opposite sides of increasingly hostile political spectrum, how do we protect the unity of the body mm. when the words of our mouths and politics not only hurt, but harm each other? Yeah, our don't, our yeah. students have great questions. They do, Corey. yeah. Fracture. 
to opposite sides of an increasingly hostile political spectrum. Um, yeah, we, we've, this, is, this is my call to you. Um, you've got to reverse this trend that's happening um, right now. Um, relationships matter. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, this very liberal Supreme Court justice, and Antonin Scalia, this very conservative Supreme Court justice, yeah. who are ideologically on opposite ends. Um, when he died, she wrote this tribute to her dear friend who they shared meals together. They'd been best buddies for 30 years. Yeah. And, and though they disagreed vehemently on some really matters of, of importance and substance, they could still be in relationship with each other. Yeah. Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, this um, pro-life, traditional marriage Republican from a red state, and President Barack Obama forged this relationship. They would have conversations and meals together and watch football games, and they knew they disagreed with each other, yet yeah. they, could, they could get along. 1995, like when some of you like, were being born, um, there was, a, there was a, 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 an upheaval of the U.S. Congress, and the, kind of the Republicans kind of came in and, and took over, this new breed of Republicans. And the then Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, said, you guys should all live back in your own communities and commute to Washington. And what happened then is what was going on in Washington is like there's no, no interaction on the Little League field with your kids. You weren't sitting next to those who are on the opposite sides politically in, in church at PTA yeah. meetings. Yeah. And, and that incarnational life with, with one another you disagree with wasn't happening. I think that added to the divisiveness of our nation. One of the most like, powerful pictures this year is at the opening of the, um, the Museum, uh, African American Museum of Culture and History. And, and here is Michelle Obama and George Bush hugging each other. Different social backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, different views on politics, obviously. Yeah. And yet they, 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 they had respect and dignity for each other. That's, that's the, the key, is that we've got to... We're listening to too much one-sided conversations, and we're in these segmented, um, I think, distorted um, sound booths right. where we're listening to the, the, the same podcast, the same talk radio, the same cable news network, and, and, and we're not, and, and that's just feeding the, the division and the one-sidedness, and that's got, that's got to stop, and we've got to like, get, get beyond that, fast from that. And, and, and get into conversations with... The, that's why we're having this, you know, such an important conversation on, on race at Biola. I mean, diversity means we're not diverse in pockets, but these, we're permeable, and we, and we engage with those in conversation that, that maybe their stories are so much different than ours are. So that's, that's what I think is the answer to that question. Yeah, I but mean, I might you, be wrong. No, you know, like the rhetoric is so divisive, right? Yeah. But the call for us to love each other, and yeah. I think there's, there's a way to get and see through the rhetoric right. and still love each other well. Yes. Okay, great. Here's another question. And kind of talking about the diversity issue you just brought up, what do you think is missing in our conversations on race and diversity? Yeah, humility, mm. listening, wow. relationships, and, and, and seeing diversity as something like, like so incredibly beautiful and such a part of what God's call for us to be. And it's not like, it's, it, it, it's going to become second nature that this is just the way in which we are. And, and, and diversity, I mean, there, there, there are tensions in these conversations. And I talked about them on October 16th and we had the diversity uh, conversation and the panel and the responses. Yeah. Uh, the chapel. But first of all, um, we need to listen more to each other. Right. And, and that, again, listening involves proximity. You know, formally, and just this, and, and listening not just on issues of diversity, but just on, on each other's stories and, and being, and listening with great interest. Yeah. And, and, and being comfortable with stories that are just so much different than our own. Yeah. It's easy to be comfortable with stories that are like ours, the same socioeconomic, you know, farm kids with farm kids, urban kids with urban kids, whatever, missionary kids with missionary kids. That's, I get that. But, but, but being involved in, in conversations and, and listening, um, being um, willing to be vulnerable and make mistakes and not being paranoid, well, am I going to say the wrong thing? I've said the wrong thing, Michael, so many times. And... And loving have people have come to me and said, you know what, there's a better way to say that. Right. And, and I've got to like, step out of my pride and say, you know what, I, I want to say it differently. I want to say it better next time. Yeah. Um, for, first of all, on, uh, on that, 
do be careful about what you say and how you say it. Don't be flippant and thoughtless with conversations that you have that might be in a joking way, because that is like really wrong um, to live that way and to be that way. But at the same hand, as you, as you try to listen, and you might not say exactly the right thing, and, yeah. and hopefully someone will say, you know, there's a better way to say that, and it's done in a, in a loving spirit and kindness, and, and, and it's, that's the better way. I think that's the Christian way. I think we should really be able to model the best way to live in harmony um, in, a, in a community that needs to be increasingly um, respectful and celebrating the, the, the beautiful diversity. That we have unity and diversity, and, and, yeah. it's, and, and diversity doesn't mean, or unity doesn't mean we all kind of like blend our, 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 our distinctives, our culture, our language, our music, our food, our families, our stories. That we celebrate those, but we do so like the mosaic center, like they, we're right. this beautiful mosaic. And that's yeah. the revelation, you know. Every tongue, tribe, and nation enters into heaven that day and, and they're recognized by their tongue and their tribe and their nation, their ethnicity, their culture, their background. They don't come without that. They come with that. And then we, we live in that way in heaven. So let's reverse engineer that and live that way today. Great, great. Let's do one last question, Dr. Corey. Okay. Okay? It's a little bit long, but I think it's a very valuable question. It says this, okay? How can Biola's education be made better so as to help mm -hmm. students grow in engaging in healthy disagreement and discussion? The way that a safe place is formed here can often feel like a safe place for specific yeah. Christian values with an absence of healthy openness and exposure to varying beliefs yeah. and convictions. Yeah, yeah um, so we can go the way of, of no diversity of thought. Right. And I'm quoting my dear friend and professor here, Dave Horner. If you have no diversity of thought, then it's a really safe place until you leave here. Right. Then you realize, I, like, how have I engaged in the world of ideas? You can, you can do all diversity of thought where there's no, anything you say is okay and, and, and there's no framework for theologically about how to think through the world of ideas and that's happening at lots of universities. Right. But I think there's a principled diversity of thought here and we need to bring in more voices, yeah. and we've done it. We had Cornell West and Robbie George here you know, last year. The year before, we had, um, on, the, on the issue of, of, of um, LGBT and how do we live out um, with same-sex attraction, you know, we had uh, Wesley Hill and, and we had um, Justin, Justin Lee. Lee here, and so we need to be a place where, where we have more conversations, by the way, and less debates. Yeah. Debates are good. I, mean, I would think debates are fine, but we need to have co respectful conversations. And, and, and this year, is one of the themes of our faculty is how do we bring in more voices within this community and how, we, how do we introduce our students to, to ideas that, that may be disruptive and may have be, be um, disturbing to think about, but, but they're, they're, this is the way we need to refine our own way of thinking not just to reinforce, like, this is what I believe, but all, like, maybe, I, maybe there's a, a different way I've, I need to think about this in respectful tones that I have thought about it before. And so the faculty is fully committed uh, to this. Um, uh, you heard the, the, the presentation, maybe you hear for uh, Dr. Deborah Taylor, as she was installed uh, a week ago as, as Provost and Senior Vice President. This yeah. is a, a strong commitment of our faculty. As, dis, as uncomfortable as this is sometimes, we've got to be more, we're a university for crying out loud. We're like a, a thought center That's and right. we cannot be overly protective of how, how we deal with the world of ideas. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. You know, diversity is a long road. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of listening, as you said. And we're on, we're on a road when we're going there. And so thank you for starting that conversation or continuing that conversation for us. And we want to engage with that. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Man. All right. Michael, thank you. Let's thank Dr. Corey today. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.